Well, uh, I'm excited to uh, kick off a new series this week, and uh, it was kind of birthed from my uh, message last week, which was entitled, A Place to Grow, and we were kind of simply alluding to the concept of Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where we're called to go into all the world and to make disciples, and it talks about how discipleship is truly something more than just bumping into somebody. It's, it's walking alongside them. It's you personally making, making a decision to plant yourself somewhere. And we talked about stewardship, and we talked about outreach, and we talked about discipleship. And so all this stuff was stirring in me, and I'm like, you know... I don't know how focused we are personally on being genuine followers of Jesus Christ ourselves. Because we can only disciple somebody to the level that we're at. And I I learned very early on in youth ministry as a youth pastor that teens didn't want something real or someone real from someone who was fake and wasn't truly living it. And and they could sense it a mile away if you were just throwing words out there rather than living it. And we're actually, we're doing this parenting study right now on Wednesday. It's called The Art of Parenting. And the whole uh, concept or theme of it is uh, based out of uh, Psalms 127. And in Psalms 127 verse 4, it says, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are... are, uh, children born in your youth. And this is an arrow that I bought my son for his 13th birthday. Not to shoot. I bought it for him and I put that verse on it because I wanted him to understand that God had a plan and a purpose for his life and that my role as his father was to equip him and then to launch him out into this world to be who God's called him to be. And that's a, it's a great idea, and it's a great concept, and it's a biblical concept. But I tell you, if me as a warrior am not living out, then I have nothing to launch him with. I, I'm not equipped to even launch him. Then he's going to have to go searching. And, and I'm going I'm to be honest with you. I have met hundreds of teenagers who are walking around searching for someone, for something, some kind of purpose, waiting to be launched out. Someone to to explain and to show them that there's a reason why they're here. There's a reason why um, they have those gifts and those talents. There's There's a reason for living that's bigger than where they're at. And so I was, as I was thinking about that concept, I was like, well, maybe we should take a few weeks and talk about truly being disciples ourselves. what it means to be genuine followers of Jesus Christ, the real deal. You know, I didn't know a lot of people growing up who were the real deal. I knew a lot of people who um, talked about God, I knew a lot of people who went to church, <laughs> but I remember when I was in high school, and this is a I think a great analogy because when I was in high school, I was wrestling with the concept of, is it really worth serving God? Is God real? Is, is my life really worth giving to him or, or should I just live my life for myself? And when I was in high school, there was this trend that was kind of going around and it was everybody was wearing fake Rolexes. Because you could go and you could buy a Rolex for really cheap down in Mexico and then people would bring them back and they'd sell them and Everybody knows in high school that if you're wearing a Rolex, it's fake, all right? We're not fooling anybody, (laughs) but yet there's this like, oh, look what I got, you know what I mean? And you wear it for about a week, and then it starts going green, you know, and then the little arms would fall off or whatever, but like for this moment, there was this like, look at me, I've got this really fake expensive watch on my hand. You know what I mean? And it's almost like you're carrying it around like it's this, this thing that makes you something more than what you really are. But yet, everybody who sees it knows it's fake, right? They know it's not real. If they saw the car I was driving, they know that's not a Rolex. But I think it's the same way with Christianity. Sometimes we just 
We have Christians walking around like with this, this confidence, like, hmm, look at me. I'm a Christian. And the world looks at them and goes, really? You? You're a Christian? You don't seem very genuine. You, you don't seem very authentic. You say one thing, you do another, you preach to me, but, but you don't look at the sin in your own life. And they, they just see right through the facade. And so I think it's really important for us as believers that we really take that step and say, okay, I don't want to just be a, a believer. I truly want to be a disciple. And a disciple is just very simply a learner and a follower of Jesus. You just made the commitment. All right, God, I want what you have in my life. And I'm going to begin to pursue you. John chapter 15, verse 8, it says this. It says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So if we truly are following Christ, then what's going to happen is there is going to be this plethora of fruit. Wherever we go, people will be able to look at us and what they need through the power of the Holy Spirit because he's doing a work in us, there will be fruit. We will have something to offer. We will have something to give. We will have love. We will have joy. We will have peace. We will have hope. We will have purpose. We will have a word of encouragement. We will have something to give because we are bearing much fruit. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says this. It says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But there's one thing that I do. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal, or the King James says the mark, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So there's, there's this goal. There, there's something that we're actually shooting for. So I've got a target over here. And I'm going to use this target as my goal. Because if you're going to shoot, if you're going to aim for something, then you need to know what you're shooting for or you're never going to know if you hit it. Correct? How do you know if you hit something if you're just randomly shooting? Now, I like it like when we go to man camp and we have a whole bunch of targets set up because I can just shoot and then pretend wherever my uh, stuff goes, that's the one I was shooting for. And it feels really good, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I made that one ding. Yeah, knock that bottle over. <laughs> that's exactly what I did. Or there's the reality, like a little while back when I went with uh, Ken to his place and I pulled out my gun, 150 rounds, I couldn't hit the target. This, like, from here to there, I could not hit the target. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Why can I not do this? Like, and he's like, well, let's try that. And I mean, over and over and over. And I knew I was missing the mark over and over and over again. So I started making adjustments. I started trying different things. And I tell you, I just could not hit the mark. So finally, Ken goes, maybe it's your gun. So he comes over, he grabs my gun, bam, right in the center. It's not the gun. I'm like, thank you, thank you, yes, yes, thank you for clarifying that. So now I understand and know I just can't hit a target at all. So as a disciple, we have a goal, we have a mark, we have something we're shooting for. And our goal is to become like Christ. That's the whole point of being a Christian. It means Christ-like. So our goal is to take on the image and likeness of the one we're following. Now, here's what's so crazy. Most people think they're so independent. And so, because you think you're so independent, you struggle with the concept of actually following someone, right? Right? Like actually becoming like Jesus. Well, I don't want to be like all the other Christians. I've heard so many people say that. I don't want to be like all the other Christians. I'm like, well, you don't have to be like all the other Christians. You just need to be like Jesus, right? And, and that's the goal. But yet, in their own life, 
how they decorate their house, what they drive, what they wear. They're following everybody else's trends and everybody else's lead. So, you know, every one of us, we're prone to follow, just saying. We are prone to follow if we like what we see. And so as a Christian, if we truly like, if we truly love Christ, then we should want and desire to follow him. And here's what it says in uh, Philippians 3, 14. Well, I already read that. John 8, 31 and 32 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, he said, Listen, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So there's this principle that if we begin to abide in Christ, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So I'm going to use this as the example, right? So if we abide in the word, if we abide in Christ, we will get to know him and get to know truth, and the truth will begin to set us free. It will begin to change us. So our focus is God and who he is and who is word, and that's what's going to change us, right? That's what we're shooting for. So if I go back to my opening analogy, if I'm a warrior and this is my kid that I'm going to launch, right? (laughs) It's really not that easy to launch your kids. I'm just saying. My wife bawled like a baby every time we left one of our kids at college. (laughs) I don't know. And we're about to send another one, John and Lavana, too. Like, it's like, okay, we've done everything, but it's so hard, right? You know, and uh, so if I'm truly a warrior, then that means I'm prepped, I'm ready, I am doing what it takes, and I'm making my focus, I'm making my focus becoming like Christ, knowing him, knowing what it is that he wants me to do, how he wants me to live. That's my focus. Now, I was kind of thinking through this concept, and... um, Maybe you've heard of the phrase, the Torah, before. So the Torah normally refers to the first five books of the Bible, but actually, you know, in the Jewish culture, it actually refers to really not just the first five books of the Bible, but also all the, all the teachings at, at that time. So that's kind of what's all wrapped up in there. And so I started kind of looking at what that really means. And what's interesting is, is the word Torah, one of the root words um, that it comes from, has to do with either taking a spear or an arrow and throwing it at a mark. So when it comes to the word and and knowing the word and understanding the word, our goal is to hit the mark, right? So we want to aim our life, our desires, everything towards the truth of who God is. And the reason why we do it is because we want to hit the mark. We want his truth and his to come alive in us, to change us, to transform us. We want to hit the mark. So we line everything up. We get all ready. I took a kid's bow because it's really easy to do like this with. Because I, 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 I thought I might end up talking and then just randomly, you know, miss fire or something. So we aim for it. Now, here's what's so amazing. I can go like this and I can aim at that, Right? I did. So here's here's what's interesting about that concept. I was aiming in the general direction of that target. I was intentionally trying to not hit the center just to prove a point, just to clarify that. This is not a repeat of my handgun experience, okay? So, yeah, you guys might want to move. (laughs) It's just a little kid's bow. It's good. (laughs) <laughs> with a real arrow. Uh, so as I was thinking about this concept of trying to become like Christ, trying to truly follow him, to, to be a real, genuine disciple or follower of Jesus, I understand that I don't completely look, talk, act, think like him. But who I am today is so much closer to who he, he is than I was 20-some years ago. 
So I've been going through this process of, of growing, of learning, of spending time in his presence, spending time in, in his word, letting him do a work in me, applying it to my life, taking these teachings, you know, studying them, meditating. I'm saying, God, what does this look like in my life? That's why when I preach, I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit practical sometimes. Like I want to give you some points to go home with because that's how it's come alive in me is I've taken it and I've applied it to my life. And how do I walk this out? How do I do this? But what happens is, it's a process. So I'm not perfect. I missed the mark. Now, if, if you take the word sin in the Bible, there's actually, man, I, th I think there's almost two dozen different Hebrew and Greek words that talk about sin that kind of describe, you know, the different na nature and character of it. But ultimately, sin, again, is missing the mark. So I, I'm trying to, with the word, hit the mark, and sin is when I miss the mark. So here's what is so good about God and his love, is he wants us to grow, and he wants us to become like him, so he has given us the ability to walk into his presence and in, in 1 John chapter 1, it says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, if you've got this fellowship, if you're following him, if you're his disciple, if you're walking in the light, you're walking with him, then, then here's what happens. Actually, I'll, just, I'll read the whole verse for you. Uh, let's go to 1 John. I think I have this in there. Yeah, chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful, and he's just, and he'll forgive us of our sins, and he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. So as we're in this process of being discipled, we're trying to be who God's called us to be, and guess what? We don't get it right all the time, but we're trying you know, there's times we bite our tongue, and then there's times where it just kind of slips out. Or there, like, there's sometimes we're just not quite there, but we're trying. Now, trust me, there is sin that's deliberate. And I'm not talking about deliberate sin right now. I'm talking about when you are trying, when you are pursuing God, when you're trying to be led by the Spirit, when your eyes are fixed on that, and you're doing everything you can to kind of go towards it. You're trying, you're trying, and then it's like, oh, I just missed it. I really did try. God, forgive me. I let it slip out again. God, I looked at that again. God, I said that again. Man, I had that anger rise up in me again. Lord, forgive me. And when you ask for forgiveness, the blood of Jesus washes, and it cleanses, and it purifies. And it's like, okay, all right. I'm not done. It's not over yet. I got to keep growing. I got to keep working on this process. So as, as I was kind of thinking through this idea of, of um, kind of going on to maturity and, and going through this process, I realized that there's a lot of things in our life and in this world that are absolute distractions. But it says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, that we're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus because he is the author and he's the perfecter of our faith. So if this is where I'm changed, if this is my goal, then I want to fix my eyes on that. And what happens is when my eyes are fixed on that, when I'm really dialed in, I have a way better chance of hitting that target. But here's what most of us do. We say, all right, you know, we come to church on Sunday. All right, here we go. God, I got this. I've got my eyes fixed on you. And then you walk out of here and somebody starts kind of talking to you and pulling you in a different direction. And you're like, what was that? Oh, you want me to go where? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, I'd love to go out tonight. That'd be, yeah. Or, no, we're over here, and all of a sudden we take our eyes off the mark, and we're walking around like believers, and we're wondering why we're like so randomly hitting things. Why is Christianity so hard? I can't even begin to like be who I'm called to be. <laughs> right? But here's the deal. If we fix our eyes on Jesus, he is the author and he is the perfecter, which means you can be changed, you can be transformed, you can become who he's called you to be. It is a process you can go through. You've just got to make sure that you're not being distracted. 
And I, and I can get all lined up here. I remember a perfect example of this. <laughs> Don't be so nervous. <laughs> we were up at camp at one of our men's retreat, and we we're going to blow up a whole bunch of Tannerite. I don't know if you've ever done that. It's awesome. I just thought of it now. I should have had a video of it. It's so cool. Anyway, so they got, they're like, Pastor Danny, you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, I want to blow up the Tannerite. So they, they, they get me my rifle, and I lay down in the ground, and I set my sights up. And my sights, it wasn't my gun. It wasn't my sights. They got, they got it all dialed in. I just pulled the trigger. That's pretty much all I did, right? So I'm laying on the ground, and I, I'm focused in, and I'm focused and I'm looking, I'm trying to get it just exactly, you know, just slight adjustments. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And everyone's like, okay, wait a minute. Well, we got more people. And I'm like, when can I shoot? And then I'm like, oh, now I got to go back, get all dialed in again. And it's like, I got to refocus. And I kept having to refocus. It was crazy because everybody's talking. Everybody's doing something. Everyone's pulling me away from what I want to do. But I tell you, when I finally said, all right, I'm not moving. I probably sat there for five minutes staring at this little crosshair in there, but it took one shot, one shot. <laughs> and the thing exploded, and it was a couple hundred yards away, and I almost died from the debris that came flying back over my head. So, <laughs> so maybe, you <laughs> maybe you should be a little worried. But here's the deal. You have to fix your focus. You got to go, okay, this is it. This is what I want. I'm not going to let circumstances, I'm not going to let people, I'm not going to let anyone take me off what I know God's calling me to do and who he's calling me to be. I'm not going to let man's opinions, I'm not going to let man's ideas, I'm not going to let anything stop me. And even if I don't have it perfect, even if I keep missing, I know that if I keep trying, I'm going to get there. After 150 rounds with that gun, I walked away. I quit. I thought, I'm done. It hurt. My arm was sore. I didn't want to do anymore. I'm like, well, now I just, now it's just too hard. And if you're truly a disciple of Jesus, you do it when it feels good and you do it when it doesn't feel good. You do the right thing when it's convenient and you do the right thing when it isn't convenient. You're, you're, you're set on it. You're going to do it no matter what. You do it when everybody's with you and cheering you on, and you do it when there's nobody there, and you're all by yourself, and they've all walked away, and you're like, I'm going to do it anyway. And you do it in the morning when you feel like it. You do it in the afternoon when you feel like it, and you do it in the morning in the afternoon when you don't feel like it because you're a disciple, that's what you do. It's not based on your emotions. And better yet, you do it when you understand why you're doing it or why God's asking you to do it. And you do it when you don't understand. Because you believe and you trust that the one you're following has more knowledge, wisdom, and insight than you ever could have. And so you're like, all right, God, I'm going to do this anyway, even when it doesn't make sense. 1 John, I already read that. James chapter 1, verse 4 says this. It says, let perseverance finish its work so that, you be, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to do it no matter what. No matter what. No matter what culture says. No matter what my, my friends say. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. No matter what. Galatians chapter 6, here's what it says in verse 14 through 17. Paul says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You see, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What really counts is the new creation. In other words, what's happening in me. What really matters is not what's going on outward. It's what's going on in me, the new creation, the man, the woman that God is making me into. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. Verse 17, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, if you look at Paul's life, he experienced a few things. He uh, didn't exactly have it easy. 
But when it talks about marks, and, and, and you kind of look at that, that, that Greek word means almost like a, like a branding. His body was beaten. He was physically branded. But more than that, the marks on his body showed ownership of Jesus that showed who was his Lord, but it wasn't Jesus who put those marks there. It was the world. The world marked him as a follower of Jesus. And he gladly embraced them. That's, I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus. And he embraced those marks. And I was thinking about that concept, and I'm like, huh. What what in our life do we even have? I mean, we have nothing that compares to what Paul went through. I don't think we have physical scars from our obedience to the Lord. But is there anything that marks us in this world? In other words, has the world marked you as one of those disciples, one of those followers of Jesus, one of those who is so so fixed on and so tuned into, who's not willing to be moved or swayed by anybody or anything. You're just sticking to that, you know, that timeless, crazy old way of thinking. And you, man, you're so old school and you're not willing to embrace the new. And has anybody marked you? If you were standing in a court, this is how, this is how we tell it to the teens, a youth group. Is there enough evidence to even convict you of being a Christian? What, what are the marks in your life that would show that you are branded for Christ? Matthew 5.10 says that we're blessed when we're persecuted for righteousness' sake. But most of us, we don't want to do the right things, or if we do, I mean, we want to. We just don't want to do them in front of everybody because we don't want the persecution that comes with it. We want to have our own little opinions, but we want to stay in our own little world, and we don't, don't want everybody to know what they are because we'll get persecuted. People will think differently of us. And, and, and we care more about being accepted in the culture than we do about the fact that we've been called out of the world to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Matthew 10.22 says, You will be hated by everybody because of me. I discovered very early on in my Christian faith that if everybody loved me, I probably wasn't doing something right. <laughs> because the truth is offensive to a lot of people who don't want to hear it. So what, what are some of these marks? Well, here's the first one I, I thought of, and they all kind of tie in together because they're all wrapped up in the same thing about us being genuine followers of Christ. The first one is the mark of truth where this is the foundation of who you are. You see, the world doesn't really have absolutes. But as a disciple of Jesus, we do have absolutes. We have made the decision that God's word is truth. John 17, 7, it says that your word is truth. And so we've made the decision and we've made the commitment that that's it. It's not what I think. It's not what I feel. I'm not going to serve God based just on convenience. When, when it works for me and it doesn't, I'm going to serve God based on convictions on, that are based on the truth of his word. That's one of the other things we just did in our parenting classes. We had everybody write out what their core values are. The truth that you're kind of setting the stage as a foundation to live your life, to raise your family, to be who you're called to be. You know, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, there's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, but yet it's not washed from its filthiness. And we live in a culture that too many times we look to to tell us what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, what's not. I was trying to think of the easiest example to kind of use for this, and I, I think this one kind of works, is, did you know in Belgium, when you're 16, you can drink alcohol? That's what the world has decided in Belgium. In Australia, it's 18. Canada, it's 19. Some provinces are 18. 
Japan, it's 20. U.S., it's 21. India, it's 25. And I'm like, isn't that right there just a, a good spectrum to look at and say, hmm, so when we let the world legislate morality, then we're going to be all over the place. Oh, but I'm 16 now. I get to drink. I'm 18. It's okay to drink. Well, yeah, it's okay to do anything the world tells you to do if, if that's your standard. But, you know, the world also says that abortion is okay. The world also says consensual sex outside of marriage is okay. The world also says when you're of legal age, pornography is okay. So are we really going to let the world legislate what's, what's right and what's wrong, what's moral and what's not? Or are we going to go to the truth of God's word? And I, I picked the alcohol one because I bet you I have had, I, I can't even tell you how many conversations I've had in the last couple of weeks with people about alcohol. People asking me about my opinion, my stance, those types of things. Do you know what I love about God and his word when you're fixed on him? I knew without anybody telling me the day before I gave my life to the Lord that if I became a Christian, I was never going to drink again. And it wasn't because anybody said, told me that. Nobody said, well, you know, as a Christian, you could have one or maybe two, but if you get drunk, that's a sin. So no, I didn't have any of that. I remember I was in my hotel room, and I walked out, and I went down to the bar, and I grabbed a drink, and I was shooting some pool, and the next day was the day I was going to Bible college. I was on my way to Bible college, and I'm drinking this beer, and I'm like, this is probably going to be the last drink I ever have. I'm tearing up like it's a bad thing. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. The Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit in me was speaking to me. And I knew what that brought into my life. I knew what that did to people. I had seen the fruit of that. And I knew that if I was going to serve God, that could not be a part of my life. And I wouldn't let it be a part of my life. And the next day when I gave my heart to the Lord and gave my life to the Lord and made him the Lord, it was gone. And I have no regrets these past 20-some years of not drinking alcohol. But you see, I didn't, I didn't let the world tell me what was right or what was wrong. I began to, to look at God's word. I'm like, oh, that's foolish. I probably shouldn't do that. Man, that, that's, that is such a gray area, man. I could fall into sin so quick. You know, I'm like, I can't. I can't do this. I'm not even going to open that door. There is no, nothing good that comes from that. I'm done. But you see, it's because I, ha I had someone who is truth. And, and that someone was so kind to give me so much wisdom in this wonderful little book for me to read and understand. And then to put his spirit on the inside of me, which made this come alive like you cannot believe. And so the combination of the relationship and his word and it coming alive, I started finding that I had a foundation I could build my life on. I had truth. So whatever situation, whatever circumstance I walked into, I, I didn't have to be moved by anybody or anything. Do you guys realize the government keeps changing their rules and their laws and their guidelines? There are states where all kinds of drugs are legal, and you can go on and on. I'm so glad that I am not looking at my life saying, what am I allowed to do? It's God. I trust you. What is morally right, and then what's going to be beneficial for me? And do you realize that he knows your weaknesses better than anybody Well else. The devil knows your weakness is pretty, pretty good too. But God knows, and he'll tell you what you need to get out of your life. Proverbs 28, 26 says this. It says, those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom or the truth are safe. So th there's the truth, the mark of truth. And I tell you, again, when you stand for truth, you, you will get persecuted. The world will call you out on a regular basis. But the next one is, is taking that truth to the next level, which is the mark of obedience. Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? 
It's amazing how many people come to church to hear their word, but very few walk through these doors with a heart and a hunger to do the word. It's not just coming to hear it. It's coming to hear it so you can do it. I want to do the word. God, what are you asking me to do? Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Man, when you walk out in obedience to God, when you do what he's called you to do, you will see the benefits and the fruit of that in your life. And it is a beautiful thing. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says this. It says, all right, since we have these promises, dear friends, let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of a reverence for God. It doesn't say being perfect. It says perfecting. You're going through the process. You're letting God weed out anything and everything that's in you that's wrong. And it's crazy because sometimes we think just being in the right place is, is going to change things or just being around or not being around things is going to fix everything. That's like me thinking that getting married was the cure for lust in my life. It wasn't. God was the cure putting myself in his presence, letting him speak his truth and him setting me free. That's where freedom came. The same way that, you know, getting a job at the church isn't going to make you more spiritual. <laughs> Walking into this building every day, that, that, that's not what does it. It's my time in his presence. It's my time in his word. It's walking out in obedience on a regular basis. That mark of obedience, is it evidence? Is it evident in your life that you're walking in obedience to the things that God is asking you to do? Because if you are, then you're going to stop living your life for yourself because you're going to make your goal to please the Lord. And, it, it, and I don't know if you've ever noticed, but any discussion I've had with the Lord about my freedoms usually came from a standpoint of what I wanted for my life. But if I'm really wanting to walk out in obedience, then it, it's not going to be about me living my life for myself. It's, God, here's what I want, but not my will, but yours be done. God, what do you want? You want me to walk away from that? I'll walk away from it. You want me to quit that? I'll quit that. You want me to go there? I'll go there. Truly being a disciple, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, you will have the mark of obedience on your life. It'll be evident. Because you don't just talk it, you walk it. And if you're going to disciple anybody, this is kind of the make or break of whether or not they even want to follow you, is whether you're truly walking out in obedience. Because there will be fruit. There will be fruit if you are a disciple. And then here's the last one. And again, these are all just, they're all wrapped up in one. And it's the mark of purpose. You see, when you're living in the world, you're going to live a life that's absolutely fueled by your emotions, by your feelings, your likes and your dislikes. But when you are truly a disciple, you are going to live a life that's fueled by the Spirit of God. God, what do you have? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? That's going to be the fuel. That's going to be what absolutely uh, drives you. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says this, so we make it our goal to please him. <laughs> That's our goal. That's what we're aiming at, just pleasing God. That's my purpose. Every day, God, I want to please you. I want to please you in my conversation. I want to please you in my relationships. I want to please you with my obedience. I want to please you. That's my goal. And you can tell people who are living that way very clearly. They're marked. They're marked. They're different. They're different than the world. That's not how the world lives. The world lives for themselves. If you are marked with purpose, then you're actually going to seek the path that's going to cause you to go lower, to become a greater servant. But if you're living on the path and the road of self and what you want, then you're going to seek the path that tries to go higher, to elevate you, give you a promotion in society, to, to draw more people to you, because it's all about you. But if your purpose is Christ, then the whole goal, goal is, I want to go lower. God, it's not about me, it's you. Let everything in my life bring you glory, bring you honor. 
God, I want to love people well. I want to serve people well. That's, that's my goal. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says this. It says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Ever-increasing glory. We're, we're, we're being changed. When our purpose is to go lower, when our purpose is to walk out in obedience, when, I, when our purpose is to connect to the one who is truth, then what's going to happen is we will begin to be transformed. We will truly be genuine disciples. We will look like him, talk like him, act like him. We will begin to be the salt in light, a genuine light, a light with no darkness that is truly sharing his character and his nature with the world. You see, living a life on purpose is living a life with intention. But when it comes to God, most people live their life intentionally, unintentional. <laughs> I'm intentionally going to go into my week and do what I want to do the way that I want to do it. And we're intentionally being unintentional about the, the very thing that we're called to be pursuing. First Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. I sat down years and years and years ago and I wrote out my whole list of I wills and I will nots, how I was going to live my life as a disciple, as a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. And I was very specific about things that I would do and things that I wouldn't do. And I had verses and I put them all the way through there. And when I was all said and done, I looked at it, and I'm like, huh, that's like a couple pages of, of stuff. And I took this verse, 1 Corinthians 10.31, and I put it at the top of the page. Sums it all up. Everything I do in my life, my goal, my goal is to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. Everything I do, it's about walking in truth, walking in his truth, walking in obedience, living my life with purpose, not wasting time, not wasting moments, not wasting energy, not wasting finances, not being distracted by anybody and everything, fixing my eyes on the mark and doing exactly what it is he's called me to do. And I'm getting closer and closer every single day. He said, I didn't want you to think I was perfect. It's a process. I'm going through it. But I've made the decision that I'm going to be a warrior. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to have people look at my life and wonder, huh, I wonder what he thinks. I wonder what he believes. I wonder why he does that. I wonder why he doesn't do that. I want them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who I am because I'm walking in the in, in the footsteps of Jesus. I'm purposing to, to be like him, to live my life with him. 